Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on the pharmacology of transporting epithelia. Right, so we've now discussed CFTR, uh, we've discussed its structure, we've discussed uh, how it's synthesized and how it's transported to the epithelium, along with uh, what the mutation Delta F508 does. Uh, now what we're going to do is study the function of this CFTR uh, anion channel. Okay, and it has rather more functions than just allowing chloride anions to um, anions to cross uh, the membrane, basically. Uh, so the way I want to do this is I want to uh, look at its function in the context of salt secretions. So I want to see. Um, uh, how uh, you signal to a cell to start uh, signaling uh, to start secreting salt, and how that leads to the activation of CFTR, and then what what action CFTR has in the context of salt secretion, and that's the main the main role of CFTR is to do that. So I want to recap basically uh, what we did in the video on secretion of salt. So let's say we have uh, an epithelial cell here, which I'll draw nice and big, so we've got lots of space to work with. So that, that's a good epithelial cell. And let's say uh, that this is the basolateral side over here. Okay, so basolateral side. Right, so this is the basolateral side. And uh, this is the apical side over here. Okay, and you have um, tight junctions joining this epithelial cell with the neighboring ones so that uh, the cell becomes polarized. Now, if you want to uh, signal for this cell to start secreting a salt, then there are two pathways basically which uh, need, which uh, activate salt secretion. Okay, so the first one is a uh, pathway which acts through the uh, GS protein. So both are um, uh, trimer heterotrimeric G protein uh, pathways, uh, but one is through the GS protein, and the other, which we'll do down here, is through the GQ pathway. So, uh, this is uh, some G-protein coupled receptor, which is coupled to the uh, protein alpha-S, basically. So this is alpha-S, and here is uh, GDP bound to alpha-S initially. And of course, it's associated with the beta and the gamma subunit, which we'll draw there. Now, when some agonist for this uh, G-protein coupled receptor comes along and activates that G-protein coupled receptor, then uh, the G-protein coupled receptor is going to become catalytically active and it will break off this GDP and replace it with a GTP. So you'll end up with alpha S, um, which I'll draw here, bonded to uh, GTP here, uh, rather than GDP. Now, alpha S GTP then goes off and activates an enzyme which is in the membrane, which is adenylalcyclase, which has this um, two transmembrane domain structure, each with six membrane spanning alpha helices, like so. So that's adenylalcyclase there, adenylalcyclase, adenylalcyclase. And basically, what is going to happen is that the alpha S GTP is going to go and activate that enzyme up here, and this enzyme is going to convert. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the energy currency of the cell, into uh, cyclic AMP, so we're going to end up with cyclic AMP, and uh, pyrophosphate, basically. Okay, so pyrophosphate, so I'll just denote that by PP. Okay, right, uh, cyclic AMP is then going to activate protein kinase A, and protein kinase A is responsible uh, for activating salt secretion, one of the things responsible for activating salt secretion. Okay, now let's put on the other uh, pathway which is going to happen, and we'll see overall how it then uh, leads to the um, secretion of salt, basically, uh, and we'll see the function of CFTR. Okay, so the other pathway down here, the other G-protein coupled uh, pathway, is uh, again you start off with a G-protein uh, coupled receptor, or a 7 transmembrane receptor. So seven transmembrane domains, and this time it is coupled to the G protein, which is um, uh, alpha Q rather than alpha S. So let's say this is the alpha Q uh, portion here, which is initially bonded to GDP. Okay, so when an agonist for this receptor comes in, so some agonist here, uh, then what's going to happen again is the, that this receptor, this G-protein coupled receptor, is going to become catalytically active and it's going to convert this alpha Q GTP into an alpha Q GTP. So it's going to break off the um, GDP and it's going to replace it with a GTP. 
So here we have alpha QGTP. Alpha QGTP then goes off and activates an enzyme which is within the membrane of the cell, which is the enzyme phospholipase C. So I'll put that there, phospholipase C. And phospholipase C takes a constituent of the cell membrane, the phospholipid by there, uh, which is PIP2. So you have some PIP2 molecule in uh, the phospholipid by there. You have lots of these PIP2 molecules in the phospholipid by there. And basically, phospholipase C takes PIP2 and converts it into two other things. It converts it into diacylglycerol, which is basically glycerol bonded to two uh, fatty acids, and it converts it into IP3, inositol 145-trisphosphate. Uh, Okay, now diacylglycerol then activates phospholipase C, uh, sorry, not phospholipase C, it activates protein kinase C, uh, which is also a really important molecule for activating the salt secretion. So we've got two protein kinases now activated, protein kinase A and protein kinase C, and IP3 uh, goes off to uh, the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, where calcium is sequestered, so this can represent the endoplasmic reticulum here, so this is the endoplasmic reticulum, and in the endoplasmic reticulum is uh, a receptor for IP3, uh, which is the um, IP3 receptor. So this is the IP3 receptor here. I'll just label that IP3 receptor. And basically, IP3 is going to activate the IP3 receptor, and the IP3 receptor is going to open and allow calcium to leave the endoplasmic reticulum and go into the cytoplasm. So we've now got overall three things that are overall happening because we have activated this pathway and this pathway. We have protein kinase A activated, we have calcium activated, and we have uh, sorry, we have calcium raised intracellularly, and we have protein kinase C activated. Now, let's put in the cystic fibrosis transmembrane uh, conductance regulator. So that is on the uh, luminal side of the membrane, so on the apical side. So let's draw its structure in here. So we know it has uh, the first transmembrane domain here, which has six membrane spanning alpha helices. Then we know it has a nucleotide binding domain one, MBD1. Then it has a regulatory domain here. And then it has the transmembrane domain uh, binding, uh, transmembrane domain two here, ending with the nucleotide binding domain 2 down there. So this is representing our CFTR, this picture over here. So basically, what's going to happen is that protein kinase C goes and activates, uh, what goes and phosphorylates this R domain, this regulatory domain of CFTR. And when it does that, so when it phosphorylates, I'll colour in this, I'll put a little pink dot to represent the phosphorylation. Uh, so it has now added a phosphate group onto the regulatory domain of our cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator. Uh, and now what's going to happen is that this is going to change conformation and it's going to expose a phosphorylation site uh, where the protein kinase A can phosphorylate. So protein kinase A is now going to phosphorylate this regulatory site. So it will add on another phosphorylation here. Um, and then uh, you can actually, the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator can now actually open. It doesn't open yet because it needs ATP to bind to both the, uh, uh, the nucleotide binding domain 1, this one here, MBD1, and it needs an ATP molecule to bind to MBD2 uh, in order to form the uh, tight MBD1, MBD2 heterodimer. Okay, so uh, what, what we have... Uh, if ATP is high enough within the cell, what's going to happen is that ATP will bind to the MBD1 and it will bind to the MBD2 and you will form that heterodimer and then the channel will open. So I will try and attempt to draw the channel going from a closed state to going to an open state. So let's try and draw it a little smaller this time. So there's transmembrane domain 1. Then we've got this MBD domain which is now bound to the MB2 the MBD2 domain. Then it has the regulatory domain here, and we'll draw it going into the transmembrane domain 2 over here, like so, and then that obviously goes and ends with this uh, MBD2 domain. So that is uh, the uh, two nucleotide binding domains uh, dimerized together with this high uh, heterodimer, and now the channel is open and activated. Okay, so now what we want to know is what is its function? Well, the first function is that it moves chloride anions, um, well, it's going to move them down their concentration gradient. At the moment, this doesn't seem to um, 
this doesn't seem we haven't you know established a, what the chloride concentration gradient is at the moment but uh, obviously we're talking about chloride secretion so obviously uh, in a moment it's going to start secreting uh, moving chloride from the intracellular environment to the extracellular environment but initially it has a more important function than that uh, which is that it um, inhibits uh, the ENAC channel. So if I draw here the epithelial sodium channel, which has four main domains, so an, it has two uh, alpha domains, which I'll draw here and here. So this is an alpha domain at the front here. There's an alpha domain at the back as well, a gamma domain and a beta domain. So this is supposed to be the epithelial sodium channel. And basically what happens is that the CFTR uh, inhibits this channel. It reduces the amount of um, the amount of sodium that is coming into the cell through this channel. So it's the specifically it's the nucleotide binding domain one which binds to this and inhibits it. In addition, what happens is the this is not just a chloride channel basically. Other things can go through the CFTR channel. And one of the things that can go through is actually ATP. So you can secrete ATP into the extracellular environment. And basically what happens is that ATP also goes and binds, is thought to also go and bind to the epithelial sodium channel and inhibit it. So basically what you get is you get some inhibition of the epithelial sodium channels in this apical membrane. Now, why is that important? Well, what is the usual function of the epithelial sodium channels? Uh, remember, and I don't know where I'm going to draw this, I'll have to highlight it to make it more obvious. Remember, in the basolateral membrane, we have a sodium-potassium pump, which I'll highlight so that it's distinguishable from everything else. So this is our sodium-potassium pump, and the sodium-potassium pump is moving sodium out and it's moving potassium in. Now, usually what is happening is that uh, the, um, the sodium is coming in through the epithelial sodium channel and then going out of the sodium-potassium pump. Now, if we inhibit this, then the sodium is going to have to come back into the cell uh, in another mechanism, uh, by another mechanism. And the channel which it uses instead is, where shall I draw this? I'll have to draw it, um, I'll draw it down here, I suppose. That's a that's a reasonable place, so we'll draw it down here. Okay, instead, the mechanism, uh, the way in which we're going to get sodium into the cell, now that we've inhibited some of the ENAC channel, is it's going to come through a, a protein called the sodium-potassium chloride co-transporter, so the NKCC, so this is the sodium-potassium uh, chloride co-transporter, chloride co-transporter, co-transporter. Okay, and its role is to move a sodium ion into the cell, along with a potassium ion into the cell, and uh, two chloride anions into the cell. So it moves potassium, uh, sodium, and uh, two chlorides. Okay, and this channel is not only activated by the fact that the epithelial sodium channel has been inhibited, but it's also activated by phosphorylation by protein kinase A. So when we initially activated protein kinase A through this pathway, one of its roles was to activate the CFTR, but it also activates this channel. But by activating CFTR, CFTR inhibits ENAC, and the inhibition of ENAC means that there's more sodium to become come into the cell through this channel, so that also contributes to activating this uh, NKCC channel. That results in you bringing chloride anions into the cytoplasm, and those are the chloride anions that are then going to leave the cell through the CFTR um, channel. Okay, so now we need to discuss another function of CFTR, uh, which is that it, is, that it facilitates uh, uh, another chloride channel uh, called uh, the outward rectifying chloride channel, basically. So C another function of CFTR, so I want to highlight where are the functions of CFTR. So here's one of the functions of CFTR. It's allowing chloride to leave the cell. Another function is that it's letting ATP leave the cell, and then that ATP is inactivating ENAC. Uh, another function of CFTR is that it inhibits ENAC by direct contact from the NBD1 domain. The f another, uh, another function of it is that it activates another channel over here, which is another chloride channel, basically, in the, um, in the apical membrane of your cell. And this channel, uh, which I'll highlight in orange, 
is called the Outward Rectifying Chloride Channel, or AUK for short. Okay, so I'll label this. This is Outward Rectifying Chloride Channel, and I'll bring this up a little bit. Outward Rectifying Chloride Channel. Chloride Channel. Okay, and it's abbreviated often to ORCC, basically. Okay, so the activation of that channel means that you have more, uh, more channels out of which chloride can leave the cell. So uh, these chloride an anions, which are coming in through the NKCC from the basolateral side of the membrane, can now leave uh, through two possible pathways, either through the CFTR directly or through this outward rectifying chloride channel, uh, which is activated uh, by uh, the CFTR protein. Okay, and we'll call it there for this video, and we'll continue in the next video.